Dr. H. Nicholas Muller III is our speaker this evening. Dr. Muller is a retired president and CEO of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. A historian, he has also served as director of the Wisconsin Historical Society and as president of Colby Sawyer College. He is also past president of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture. Dr. Muller is former associate dean of arts and sciences at UVM, where as a professor of history, he taught US and Vermont history. He is a fellow of the Vermont Academy of Arts and Sciences and holds a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Center for Research on Vermont. I know we are in for an informative evening. Please welcome Dr. Nolan, Dr. It's nice to see everybody here. I'm going to begin by simply saying that um, I had some anesthesia things shoved down my throat, and I'm a little, my voice doesn't carry the way it once did, but I'm hoping that that thing works well for us. Uh, I haven't looked at these polls for a while, but I know that in 1978, the AIA, the American Institute, AIA, American Institute of Architects, put, did a poll among its membership about what the most important buildings were. Falling Water finished fourth, the Roby House finished ninth. In 1991, Falling Water ascended to first place. The Roby House stayed in ninth. It gives you a sense of the, uh, how people regard it. Now, i see if I can, whoop, what did I do wrong? I hit the wrong button there. We'll get some help. <laughs> you, you understand, you ought to go to the Vermont Humanities <laughs> Council Conference <laughs> because, I, I, thank you. When I went to, to work at the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, uh, many of the people who had been with Mr. Wright in the 30s were still there, and they had lots of stories to tell. And to some extent, what I'm going to tell you this evening is what I heard originally about falling water, and that's why the title of this was uh, The History and Mythology. I learned that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wright established the fellowship in 1932. Mr. Wright had been not very successful. His last built major project was the Imperial Hotel in, in Tokyo, finished in 1922. From 27 to 32, he had five commissioned drawings, but two buildings built in that entire period. Uh, one of them um, was for his uncle in Tulsa. The other was the Willie's house in Minneapolis. The story I next heard was the Edgar Kaufman Jr. It was E.J. Kaufman Sr., his father, who commissioned and built Falling Water. But Edgar J. Kaufman talked about returning from Europe in 1933, having read Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography and how stunned he was by it and that he was going to go to Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin and become a member of that fellowship. In fact, uh, he didn't come back from Europe until 1934 and it's probably a fictitious uh, statement. Then we know that E.J. Kaufman commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to do a house for him on Bear Run, close to Ligonier or Ohio Pile, Pennsylvania. Ed Edgar J. Kaufman says that he was the one that introduced Mr. Wright to Mr. Kaufman. That's also not true. 
The story the apprentices would tell was that he got a call, Frank Lloyd Wright did from Milwaukee in 1934, and hadn't done the work that he was supposed to in 35, and he shook the design out of his coat like this overnight. In fact, Kaufman was in Chicago, not in Milwaukee. And in fact, this presentation drawing done by Jack Howe, one of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's best draftsmen, who eventually went to work as an architect for himself in Minneapolis, and eventually had uh, a falling out with his mentor. Um, if you examine that presentation drawing closely, you can see all kinds of places where there are erasures and it was drawn over. This was not done overnight. Or the construction of falling water with those great uh, balconies, as you can call them, but uh, demonstrated Frank Lloyd Wright's innate, intuitive sense of material and construction. It, 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 his design genius. And then the story is told, and we'll get to a photograph or two of the building uh, being constructed. And there were wooden braces under all of those uh, wonderful balconies. And that he was there in 1937. The Certificate of Occupation came in 1938, but it was essentially uh, ready to go in 37. And Frank Lloyd Wright asked the construction people to get rid of those props. And then fi finally, they didn't want to get rid of them all because they were worried. <laughs> so Frank Lloyd Wright got there and took the last of those beams and stood under it, and it stayed. He was not there then. <laughs> but uh, there is a story, and I think this one is true, that when he built the Johnson Wax Building, and I'll have a photograph for you, with those pillars that look like intake valves on an uh, internal combustion engine, st small, slender, stem and then opening up uh, at the top to hold up the building. And the uh, design, the Wisconsin construction uh, management, whatever it was in Madison, uh, said you can't build it because that can't possibly hold the weight that's to be on it. And so Wright got out there. This one, I've seen photographs, so I'm pretty sure about it. He uh, got out there and guided and had a, uh, a crane start lifting sandbags on it until it had three times the weight on it that it needed to carry. And then um, he stood under it, and then he got out of the way when they cut the guy wires and the thing tumbled. <laughs> As it should have. There was nothing holding it up. There's also the myth that this was an instant architectural success, falling water, recognized around the world. Well, his crowning achievement. Now, it did help that Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce were very close friends with Mr. and Mrs. Wright. There are now designs that Claire Booth Luce did little mosaic kind of things with pebbles hanging in the living room at Taliesin West in Scottsdale. So is it any surprise that Henry Luce put Frank Lloyd Wright on the cover of Time magazine? It shouldn't be. And you're now going to learn a few things about eventually E.J. Kaufman, and he was a master publicist. So in 1932, Frank Lloyd Wright hasn't had commissions for five years, or two, five commissions, two buildings. He was considered a has-been. 
He was born in 1867 in Richland Center, Wisconsin. Boy, I get into Vermont, I want to say Vermont all the time. Uh, he was born in Richland Center, Wisconsin. His autobiography says he was born in 1869. He was born in 1867. But, you know, he's not always believable. He was broke. The documentary evidence of that is clear. Uh, he wrote to Darwin Martin, his patron in Buffalo, uh, who had built the Larkin Building and then Darwin Martin's home, and then Greycliff, uh, a summer place on Lake Erie, uh, that Mrs. Wright was cutting up tablecloths to make jackets and coats for them, that they didn't have any money. Of course, he had a cord, a beautiful big cord automobile. I mean, he always manages to live better than his income level, uh, but that happens to a lot of folks. Mrs. Wright encouraged him to write his autobiography, which was published in 1932, and literally sold very well. The first publication of 2,500 copies went overnight. Um, people liked to read it. She also encouraged him to lecture and to write uh, reviews and he did, and they were acerbic and generally uh, pretty uncomplimentary for anybody around him. He was really angry when the MoMA Modern Architecture Show of 1931 uh, was planned, and he, he had to do some backstage things to even get into it. He was considered a has-been. The drawings he did for it were not really, in his view, appropriately placed in the exhibit at MoMA. He was encouraged by Mrs. Wright to start a school of architecture, but he'd spent so much time slamming the University of Wisconsin that they weren't interested at all in having that happen. And so they invented, they invented the fellowship. In 1932, he offered young men and women an opportunity to come to Taliesin to learn architecture and the arts and music, dancing. Uh, Mrs. Wright was an accomplished dancer and a, basically a profession, professional at it when he met her in 1924 in Chicago. The uh, 23 fellows arrived paying 670 some dollars tuition and the next year he raised it to $1,100. That was a lot of money in 1932 and 1933. Why did they come? Well, I, this is Nick Muller talking. I, I don't really have much proof of it. But I do know that generation that was growing up after the first war were told that if you go to school and you do well, there will be things waiting for you when you get out so you can have a good career and good success. The 1920s were a roaring economy. When they got out in the 30s, after 29, there wasn't anything for them. They'd studied hard, they'd done well. They couldn't find work. They were disillusioned. And they had this clarion call come issued by Frank Lloyd Wright who was not working much anymore, but who was well known. He's sort of the leader of the modern period in, in the United States. In 1903, he produced the Larkin Building for the Larkin Soap Company. That was Darwin Martin's company. In 1904, Unity Temple uh, in Oak Park, uh, Illinois. In 1909, the Roby House, which finished number nine in these AIA polls. Uh, pretty good record. One of the things about the Larkin House, that not the Larkin House, it was the Larkin Building, it, of course the mayor of Buffalo had to tear it down to put a parking lot on, but he was in the paving business. <laughs> the main promoter marketing person for the Larkin Soap Company who started doing these uh, promotions you know, with premiums 
you buy a box of Larkin soap or is a premium in, you got enough premiums you could turn those in on a set of China, Buffalo China, or things of that sort. His marketing head was Elburn Hubbard, Roy Crofters, the man who essentially in East Aurora, New York, set up a community of craftspeople. And he lectured to them every Sunday about philosophy and religion. He was a good friend of Rene Stewart. Uh, the, I'm searching for his last name, Macintosh, the Scots de designer. And frankly, Knight Wright would never admit it, but do you ever notice any similarities between his prairie style furniture and Macintosh's furniture and Helbert, Elbert Bridge Hubbard's? They're very close. But to go through the right records, you never even hear a whisper about Hubbard. And when I tried to get the right scholars interested in looking into that, they weren't interested either. Uh, so that's what's going on when he meets Edgar Kaufman Sr., E.J. Sr. E.J. Sr. had immigrated from Germany. Actually, he was born here. His parents immigrated from Germany. He acted very much like you'd expect him to be nouveau riche, but he wasn't. His family went back five generations, five <coughs> centuries in Germany. Uh, they were uh, of some means. And they started and they built uh, the Kaufman's department store uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Think about the role of the department store in the 20s and 30s. They've been pretty well eclipsed now, but they were extremely important and they drew crowds. And he made sure that his department store was going to grow, grow, draw a crowd. Let's see what we got. That's the West View. Oh, we get it. That's the Roby House, Woodward Avenue in Chicago. There's Mr. and Mrs. Wright. She is a big player in, in Mr. Wright's uh, later work. There's E.J. Jr. for you on the left, E.J. Sr. on the right. And Mr. Wright is fairly obvious who he is. Um, there is, is Falling Water being constructed. Those are those beams, are the wooden props holding it up. There's Frank Lloyd Wright on the cover of Tamp Time magazine. There's the young architect that's the Larkin building in Buffalo, a really incredibly important building. The interior of the Larkin building, the Irving House in Decatur, Illinois, the Imperial Hotel in 1922, and one of his cement block uh, houses built in Los Angeles um, before 1927, and uh, that's the Ennis House. His son, Frank Lloyd Wright, Jr., set up an architectural practice in Los Angeles and may well have been one of the better architects the country's produced, but he never could get out from under his father's reputation. And uh, this was built by uh, Mr. Wright and his son. There's Taliesin, and we'll get to that. Edgar Kaufman is wealthy and moves in wealthy circles. Uh, he was not as wealthy as some of his neighbors, the Mellons, Henry Clay Frick, Carnegie, H.J. Hines, but he was seriously wealthy. He was a great marketer. He kept a high profile. And he did things to keep the high profile. When Einstein visited Pittsburgh, who did he stay with? E.J. Kaufman. 
when some other department stores were building up around it, uh, EJ built bigger ones and better ones. One. He had interest in design. Uh, he, he built some houses. He built some public buildings, a synagogue. He understood that architecture was one of the best forms of propaganda. Probably the only one that's better, better is winning a battle. But he knew that this, a good piece of architecture uh, would attract attention and could hold attention. And so he did that. In a, he did Flemish uh, for a house in Fox Chapel, Pennsylvania. He learned to ride to the hounds. Because he was Jewish and couldn't get into any of the clubs of the Fricks and the Melons or Carnegie, he built the Concordia Club on the north side of Pittsburgh. Uh, he was uh, started a newspaper for his employees. He took care of his employees, paid them well, and that's uh, sort of about how Bear Run came about. He was a serial philanderer. He spent at least in the 1930s 400 and some thousand dollars on one mistress, had a, uh, an affair with one of his employees, wasn't shy about it at all, set up a trust fund for her, and they're, they're her issue, and he had a daughter by her, are still living in part on that trust fund. He very much felt the Jewish exclusion um, is interesting and good man. That's the Taliesin living room and fireplace. Out of Frank Lloyd Wright's autobiography. That's the fellowship. And I, it, I can recognize some people in there, uh, some that I knew, that almost all are not gone now. That's Mrs. Wright sitting there with a, a bag on her hand. That's their daughter, Ivana, uh, sit, standing beside. She was born about a year before they were married. There they are standing at Taliesin in 1934. I don't spot E.J. Kaufman Jr. there. I just, uh, I don't. But that doesn't mean uh, that he wasn't in the fellowship because he was, it's documented. And uh, our, our friend Wes Peters is not visible there either. And he was certainly in the fellowship in 1934. That's E.J. Kaufman, a portrait. Uh, he managed in 1909, or 1906, I, to get his hands on the ownership of that department store. One of the ways he did it was to marry his cousin, Lillian, who changed her name a little later to Lillane. And uh, she was a little bit of a philanderer, too. <laughs> but it, you know, some people will say it was because she was retaliating for him or because he was so cold. Uh, who, she, who knows? But she was heavily involved in, that world, in uh, his Kaufman's department store. She established a, uh, based on European design and European goods, she set up a very popular uh, wing of the store, made quite a bit of money. Um, he, of course, he has a writing crop. There's Edgar Kaufman in 1940. Um, and there's his wife. It's a bizarre painting. It's her head. But her breasts belong to a model in Los Angeles. That's a mistress, Grace Stoops. She was worth about a quarter of a million dollars in gifts um, when they were together. And there they are at Falling Water. He was brazen about this. And there's Edgar Jr., E.J. 
on the right as I look at it, and Lulain, the happy family. E.J. Jr. talked about falling water as if he were the one that had promoted it. It's not accurate. He called his father a client of Mr. Wright's, not someone who was intimately involved with the design and the construction. He hid uh, these things when uh, Franklin Tooker, from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, architectural historian, was invited to give a lecture at, at Columbia University, where Edgar J. Jr. held a, a uh, professorship in architectural history. Uh, Tooker began to talk about E.J. Jr.'s role and got, he shouldn't have done it because he got blackballed. He no longer was documentation from Columbia or other places available to him until after E.J. Jr. died. There's something strange going on there. Um, and the merchant prince, Kaufman himself, there he is in, that's Kaufman's department store. And that's the first one. The shorter building, uh, that facade was uh, torn down and rebuilt uh, higher. There's E.J. and Frank Lay Wright in the living room at Taliesin West. There is the fellowship in uh, building Broadacre City. Broadacre City was Frank Lloyd Wright's idea that a square mile could be developed to look like in housing, recreation, uh, uh, industrial life, transportation. And one of the ways in which department stores were so popular is that, that uh, there he is, that's the that's not a bookcase. That's Broadacre City on its edge. And Frank Lloyd Wright's looking at his design. That was first exhibited anywhere by Cornelia Brierley in Kaufman's department store in Pittsburgh. It, it, they, were, they would have lectures, uh, programs for people. Don't misunderstand the importance of the department store. There's Point Park Center. E.J. was interested in having Frank Lloyd Wright design for the city of Pittsburgh. E.J. was one of the people who was going to be involved in the Pittsburgh Renaissance uh, after you know, the steel mills had pretty well uh, blackened the place. And uh, that was going to be done at the, at the point. There's a, a night rendering of it by Davy Davidson. Uh, that's what it, Frank Lloyd Wright thought it would look like. That was a parking garage designed for Kaufman's department store, never built. Point Park Apartments. Uh, if anybody's been to Pittsburgh, you know when you're downtown or in Heinz Field um, and you look across at the hillside where the incline is, those were going to be built along the top of that hillside. A really magnificent design. Incidentally, Heinz Field with the Steelers play is now being played over the site of a Kaufman warehouse. Just concrete rubble now. Does somebody ever ask you that for trivia, you've got it. Again, that same point of view residences. And that's the site of Bear Run. How did Kaufman get to Bear Run? He was there and was in the woods. And he tried to buy the property for his employees to use as a relaxation place, a swimming place, a picnic place. He was turned down for a uh, 
CCC, a Conservation Corps program there and grant. And so he eventually just bought the land, but he bought it in his wife's name. But that's how he got to Bear Run. And when he met Wright, and he was really interested in Wright in terms of his own interest in architecture, which constantly changed. It was from the early, you know, huge mansions, but based on Flemish design or some other design. Uh, he became a modernist with his department store. He was, that's how he got interested in Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he eventually ditched Wright when he and his wife would go to uh, California in the winter, LA, Palm Springs. Uh, he couldn't stay in hotels except in the off season because he was Jewish. Uh, but that's where he met California architects like Richard Neutra, who were really doing advanced uh, modern stuff. And E.J. moved away from Wright and onto the newer, uh, more avant-garde uh, architecture. Oh, wrong way. Got this thing turned around. That's a section drawing uh, of Taliesin. Wow. Uh, of uh, falling right, falling water. There were, he was accused of naming it falling water because that was FW. I think that's myth too. There it is under construction. More construction. That's uh, sizable water. The house from the east. When you go visit, you approach it from the west or the northwest. I frankly, I, it's always that design has always just stunned me. I love that. Uh, does anybody know what that is? It's in falling water. That's the front door. He hid the front door. The little, that, that's the whole thing. But if you stand there and look across the living room, you see what it looked like that way. The living room again. And that was the dining area. I don't think they cooked with what I heated with it. No one in the, nothing Frank Lloyd Wright ever designed didn't have a fireplace. The, um, there was a sociologist and, uh, in the, I guess now the early 80s, who talked about Frank Lloyd Wright and fireplaces and why Wright tended to put the living quarters on the second floor, but always had a fireplace at Inglenook for warmth and heat, but the living space on the second floor because you needed to look out to see who was approaching you. It was kind of an anthropological uh, view of how Wright designed and why the roofs, uh, he didn't have flat ceilings in most of his houses the roof line and the ceiling line on the second level sort of followed one another. And that was also uh, uh, for design's sake. You didn't get <laughs> publicity? Pretty good, Gary Cooper playing Howard Rourke in the Fountainhead, who was obviously Frank Lloyd Wright by Anne Rond, uh, who was a good friend of Wright's. So you have that in Time Magazine and all of EJ's uh, work. EJ was uh, producing for Kaufman's department store whole page ads, not only in the Sun-Telegraph in Pittsburgh, uh, which William Randolph Hearst owned and had bought, but in other major uh, publications. Uh, he was also buying these things in magazines uh, for his store 
and uh, of course he got Mr. Wright into these as well. There are Mr. and Mrs. Wright together. Um, probably about the time Falling Water went up. There they are, a Taliesin uh, driving our, our horse. Frank Lloyd Wright. And that's the end of those slides, but I'm not quite done. The construction was begun in 1936. Kaufman went to Pittsburgh engineers to check on Mr. Wright's plans. They didn't like them. He wanted to build them. Frank Lloyd Wright said, no, you're not going to put re reinforcing steel in there or anything. I've designed it, it's right. Well, the apprentices who oversaw this program, in fact, did put reinforcing stuff in there. <coughs> Surreptitiously, I put those in. It's owned by the Western Pennsylvania uh, Heritage Society, uh, and they just recently put $900,000 worth of reinforcement on those. Uh, The, so it's a public acclaim for this building. Great promoters of a client and an architect, both of them with friends who were well-placed in media, print media uh, in particular, but also motion picture. The Fountainhead with Anne Ron. This is not really what you would call, and what you may have expected, is an architectural uh, analysis. Uh, I don't speak architect talk very much. I've got two sons who are architects, and they haven't taught me that language very well. But it's a historian's look at how this building got built what the mythology is that's developed around it. Where it sits in the record of American architecture, how the individuals involved with it had their own games to play. Mr. Wright, Mr. Kaufman, Edgar Jr., Lillian, the apprentices, and the ones that were alive when I was at Taliesin would talk about this freely and probably incorrectly much of the time. Their memories being what they wished them to tell, what they thought they had seen and lived through. So we have this enormously important building, enormously beautiful building. And maybe you understand a little more about how I got there, and who did it, and what they did. And I'd like to thank the Norwich Historical Society, the Norwich Library, and the Vermont Humanities Council for letting me come here and talk with you and bore you. <laughs> yes. I think I could, I'm being asked if I'd take you an A, and I will. Uh, I'd like to tell you a story about one of your Vermonters with Q&A, uh, Archibald Cox. Remember him, the, the night of the long knives when he resigned? He's from Windsor, in the Cox family. And uh, we brought him to Wisconsin to talk, and he was very good. But he was also somewhat deaf. And uh, we had about 300 people in our auditorium. And I did your job, Ms. Otto. And then uh, I announced to the crowd that Mr. Cox would be happy to respond to questions, but that I would take the questions and repeat them to him. And I, well, they could hear me. Oh, you me to do that? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I want to tell you about the Wisconsin man uh, who ran for, you, you get elected judge there, you don't get appointed. 
and he ran for judge in the northern part of the state. And uh, he was out politicking all the time, and he was a big wheel in the party as well. And he fell in love with the fav favorite drink in Wisconsin, or Brandy Manhattans. <laughs> and he'd start coming home at night, three sheets to the wind, and causing all kinds of trouble. And his wife one day came down with her, you, you, you know, with picking her with a rolling pin in her, in her bathrobe on, and her hair up in curls. And she said, if you come back drunk one more time, I'm divorcing you. I'm taking all the money you have, and this marriage will be over. So he shaped up for about 10 days. <laughs> came back one night, three sheets to the wind. Came in, reaching for the light switch, hit the rack of pots and pans. They all fell. He fell. And the next thing, the light is on, and there she is. What do you have to say for yourself? Madam, I will take questions from the floor. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions from the floor. Yes, sir. You got to just dial it up a little for me. Who? Anthony Quinn. No. Anthony Quinn. Uh, I showed you that picture of Ivana. She got, how do we put this politely? She wanted him. And she chased him around some. Uh, and particularly, it was a bad scene in a New York hotel. So he did know Mr. Wright, and he did know Ivana. Uh, who, and I can attest, she was a handful. Not, oh, I shouldn't have said that that way. <laughs> she was, uh, I was the one that eventually kicked her out of Taliesin because of the fellowship and people just couldn't muster up the courage to say that to Mr. Wright's daughter. But she, she needed mental uh, health, uh, help. So there is a, re a Quinn relationship, but it's not a student relationship. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. How much of an impact did falling water have on subsequent uh, buildings around the country? Was it one of these things that uh, everybody admired but nobody imitated, or did it have a real impact on the labor? Oh. Uh, it did have an impact, and I'm trying to right now uh, think of, uh, well, go to the Norwich Historical Society and you'll see a, a, a few places uh, where the apprentice who came here and designed four houses, his house has uh, some uh, features. There are other features, maybe Peter Brick can pick them up quicker and I can't write. I know what you're talking, what you're asking. It did have an impact. Um, why can't I Im immediately tell you some of the places it did? That's my failing because I know them. And um, yeah, we had uh, a few years ago on PBS. I think I don't know if it was Ken Burns. But it was Burns on Frank Lloyd Wright. Right, and there was a segment there discussing how uh, many months had gone by and Wright hadn't uh, provided Edgar Kaufman with the design of the house yet, and and suddenly uh, Kaufman called and said, "I'm coming to <coughs> be there in four hours or something like that." And it sounds like. You're saying that that particular instance didn't really happen. He didn't sit down at an easel and sketch out something. And, and that, I'm saying that for sure. And the reason I can be sure is the presentation drawing. Will, will this thing flip over? That one. That one has all kinds of marks of erasure and drawing over it. I don't think I hit the wrong one. I think I've, I was going back to the. Oh. No, I'll flip that one then. Yeah, yeah, that drawing, if he had shaken it out of his, that's what they believe at Taliesin. He didn't. He probably did that, uh, not that drawing, but did some of the basic drawings in his bedroom at Taliesin. And when he knew EJ was going to be coming, not the same afternoon in four hours. Um, and they all thought was, that story was about Milwaukee and not Chicago, but 
we can fix EJ in Chicago. Uh, the section drawings and things, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright probably had done some of that. And he was a very fast draftsman. But he did not do that one. That, that was uh, Jack, I already told you, Jack Howe uh, produced that. As Mr. Brink will tell you, uh, he was wrong. It was actually bending a little very early on. And that's why the Western Pennsylvania group that owns it uh, had to put so much money, actually had to keep people out of there for a few years. Uh, it was dangerous. Uh, there are numbers of examples of rights uh, not estimating properly the capacity of wood, essentially, which he wanted, not metal. Although, you know, I don't know how much all that is accurate either, because the columns on the, on the Johnson Wax building were reinforced with both metal. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a piece of the column at Taliesin that you can see, and it's concrete wrapped around a, 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 a metal mesh. So I, you know, I didn't put a stethoscope to it, but I saw it <laughs> many times. Yes, ma'am. Will the speaker on the floor take a question from heaven? <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us, uh, uh, Bear Run is a very beautiful stream. Uh, yes. Would you give us your perspective on why he chose to site the house the way he did? and also your experience over the seasons about uh, some dramatic times that you may have been there, seasons that you love. Which I love? Yeah, which seasons you like? What, do you like high water, low water, winter? Why did you put the house? I have been there when there was no water. <laughs> I didn't like that. Uh, I sort of like in between high and low, uh, but not no water the way it was. It was dried up uh, one time. I, I got some of my early interest in architecture in, on Fire Island at the Pines. And I really love the horizontal and the vertical lines. And that's, that's why Nick Muller relates to falling water. Uh, I'm not a particular fan of the uh, prairie style architecture that uh, is all over Oak Park, except for certain buildings. But that's my taste. Um, I, I've always been very impressed that Wright could go through so many different vocabularies and do them well. You know, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, incredible. Or his Usonian houses, or the Marin County Civic Center. Um, they are just amazing places to me. And he did build up a cult. I mean, he was Mr. Wright. Nobody called him Frank, except his wife. I've not met him. He was gone before I got there. But there was a lot of them there. Yes, ma'am. Did falling water and any publicity around it have a direct impact on the near-term future commissions that he was getting? Oh, what it restored his business. So what, what did he build right after that? I'm just curious. Uh, among the things he built right after that, the Johnson Wax Building, Johnson uh, Wing Spread, uh, Sam Johnson's home, um, the, the Civic Center in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, he designed it in 1937. Didn't get built until I think it opened in 1996. But it's incredible building. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. With those helixes? Oh, jeez. Uh, 
the Usonian houses. Uh, he built his, the, the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, well, it certainly restored his, his cachet. Would I say all because of that? Probably not. He did know how to change his vocabulary. I mean, artistic vocabulary. Not many folks can do that, that I've seen. And those Usonian houses are wonderful. And he's built, uh, he designed pretty close to uh, a thousand buildings. And he had literally built um, over 400. Incredible career. He, they used to talk of, in the, in the fellowship, he really didn't like Mies van der Rohe. He didn't like Corbusier uh, at all. He didn't like Cropius and Italius and, you know, at, uh, flies and things. He'd swat a fly, gotcha, Mies. Swat a fly, gotcha, Mies. Swat a fly, gotcha, Gropius. He, uh, and he really disliked Philip Johnson for a long while. Uh, because Philip Johnson had tried to cut him out of that MoMA show in 1931. And he didn't like the glass facades uh, that much. I can remember, as Peter was there that day, but he was not standing with me when we visited the glass house. Uh, and I, uh, there, and then later, or maybe earlier, I tell yes, and asked Philip Johnson uh, what he thought of Mr. Wright. And he, he said, uh, I've learned to respect and like him. And I don't know if this is true or not, but we were riding across Indiana, and Mr. Wright said to me, I'll point to all the houses I've influenced. If you can point to any, you have. <laughs> yes? He, he would hire often with the client, but he, the local people to build. But he always sent an apprentice or two from, who were working with him to essentially oversee the project. Was it, a good, was it an easy experience for those workers, or was it? Was it easy for them? Yeah, was he hard? Well, I, you know, the, certainly, I think it was Bob Mosher at, at uh, Falling Water. Uh, the record he left behind, no, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all, uh, especially when he had to surreptitiously reinforce it. <laughs> yes? I wouldn't call it the latter, but uh, I'm really of mixed feelings, not about your question particularly, but about his sense of structure and material. Uh, there's a, one of the houses at Taliesin in Scottsdale is called the Sun Cottage, S-U-N, uh, since Ivana lived there with one of her four or five husbands. They call it the son-in-law cottage. <laughs> but if you sit in that building, you realize he didn't have the computer-assisted architectural programs. So right now, you can ask an architect to show you what the sun coming in that window will look like and hit at a certain time of a certain day of the year. And they're doing that. He had none of that. And yet, if you sit in that sun cottage in April, there's sunlight coming in. In May, there's none. It was designed so that in the colder months, the sun would come into that. And in the 
warm months, it would not have that kind of gain. So that was intuitive. Did he make some errors? Yeah. One of the famous stories I'm sure most of you have heard <coughs> is uh, Hib Johnson sitting at his table in wing spread at the, uh, having dinner in his house in Racine. And he calls Mr. Wright on the phone. It's raining and it's leaking on me. What should I do? And the answer was, move your chair. <laughs> should we call it a night with that? OK. Let me say again, thank you for all, to all of you for coming. My goodness, Peter Bruce has one question. You go. Well, a Norwich question. Uh, Is that okay? As, as people will see in the lovely exhibit that the Historical Society has done, there are several houses in Galveston. That, that's a program. In Norwich, designed by Alan Gelman, and he was a fellow of Frank Lloyd Wright, and I wondered if you would ever come across him in your time at the Frank Lloyd Wright. He was not there then. He had, uh, he died about, a, when did he die? In 1990, what? 32. Two, three. He was, I, I didn't come to that position until 96. He had also moved on then uh, to Connecticut and to Vermont. And uh, I think he tried to come back to Taliesin for some period. He died in a friend's house who wasn't there. And he wasn't found for about a month. The, uh, when I inquired, I guess you really the one that started it, but it came uh, from another source, uh, wanted me to know if I had any information about him. And I inquired of people who did know him. And I got a very mixed response. Some thought he was a bit of a hanger on her, and others thought he was a wonderful guy. I just don't know. It depended on who you talk, with whom you talk. I apologize for my voice tonight. It's not very good, good but it's getting better. Um, thank you again. To